Hey everyone, my name is Radu Rusu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fusion. Some of you might know me from my previous work while being a researcher at Vila Garage, as well as uh, working and uh, being a lead maintainer and creator of the Point Cloud Library project. Um, this is a very unusual presentation for me. I'm usually in front of a room of people. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll do my best to try to take you through a journey uh, from you know, how I got started into the field of robotics and computer vision as well as like how did I end up working, uh, you know, and going from academia actually into the industry and, and what I think is this whole thesis of uh, open science and open, open research. So <laughs> for those of you that don't know me at all, uh, I'm actually born in uh, Transylvania, Romania. Uh, it's, I guess, closer to you if you're watching this from, from Europe, pretty, pretty far away from where I'm currently located. Um, I did my undergrad there, uh, and then I had the opportunity to go to uh, the Technical University of Munich um, while working with uh, Professor Beetz um, in Bavaria, Germany, um, where I studied, you know, I did a lot of computer vision with a focus on 3D data for robotics. During my PhD, I actually had an opportunity to go and work at the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, uh, with people like Brian Gerke, who I'm sure <laughs> will hopefully be a presenter at the conference as well. Uh, as well as many other, you know, uh, industry luminaries on, uh, on again, um, robotics related research. Um, and then following that stint, uh, I actually went back to California in uh, 2009, um, right after I finished my PhD to work at the Wheel Garage. So my whole sort of like, uh, you know, academic research and the last maybe decade plus, right, 15 years now, have been centered around this idea of point cloud data and point cloud processing. And as a joke, a lot of folks still don't know really what it is. Um, and I'm kind of doing a, a mishmash right now of different slides from different presentations that I've given over, over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, point clouds are starting right now to actually be kind of get, be in vogue. Um, more and more uh, sensing devices come out with, uh, with LiDAR-like capabilities as well as, you know, time of flight cameras and so on. Um, so it's, it's a much more sort of like um, interesting topic uh, and, and folks know about it than, than it used to be, you know, let's say 10 years ago. But the whole thing uh, during, again, my uh, research years um, was to apply, you know, computer vision and machine learning uh, applied on the 3D data uh, to make uh, robots like the PR2 at Villa Garage do interesting things, right? So. You know, some of you might, might be familiar with the, with, the, with the work that we've been doing there. Uh, this is one of those many examples of, of sort of like, you know, applications or, or proof of concept sort of like demos uh, where you have to go with this machine that has a lot of like sensing devices, a lot of like, you know, with cameras and LiDAR and so on and sense the world and come out of this with a representation of the world that's, that has semantic meaning. And so to do this again, this is, this is a joint uh, collaborative effort between many different types of researchers. Um, so it's very, very difficult to actually uh, get right. Um, so, you know, I was trying to kind of like zoom out while during my, my robotics years um, and, and come up with this like thesis of kind of like where have we been and where are we going in terms of the whole sort of like computing paradigm. So if I think about mainframes as being what my, you know, essentially my dad worked on, you know, when I was young, uh, just 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 a kid, right? Mainframes, and then we all kind of got uh, into the whole like PC era. Um, and there's this thesis of 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 you know what are the main modalities for operating these devices? So I guess on a PC you have a keyboard and a mouse. You still do that. Um, and then at, at a certain point in time, this next generation of computing kind of like came on board. Uh, the smartphones, you know, tablets, where you know, cameras and touch sensors are much more prevalent. Uh, wearables, you know, lots of things like, you know, the, the Apple Watch and Android smartwatches and so on, as well as many other different types of wearables were, were invented. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, we're looking at robotics as like the next big thing. And if you think about the robotics, um, there's still a dream of the personal robot that, you know, uh, I guess much more than, than, the, than the personal kind of like vacuum cleaner that is a robot itself, but more in the sense of a PR2 like uh, machine. But anyway, those come with three sensing and actuation. Those are like the main modalities. And, and three sensing 
is, is a very interesting new way of, of uh, looking at the world that I guess prior to that, uh, we didn't really kind of like uh, approach too much. So if you think about this generation of computing, uh, these generations of computers kind of like coming coming to market and so on, uh, and robots just being yet another type of a, of a, of a computer, you know, the big question is like, are, are we ready to sort of like build these and, and use them, right? Um, and so, you know, the way I was, I think I was teaching at Stanford when I, when I gave this presentation, I, I, I don't think so. I think we're still pretty far away uh, because ultimately the thing that we also discovered at Wheeler Garage were that the machines that we were building couldn't really do a lot of things, right? It was very difficult to program them. And I know there's been a lot of work done on, over the last decade or so, but still ultimately we're not, we're nowhere near, um, I guess, the dreams that we, we, we had and we're still having, right? So you get this like interesting chicken and egg problem, right? You know, you have machines that can't do many things, therefore you can't, can't really sell them, you can't really have a market. You can't have enough robots out there in the world to gather enough data to make them smarter, right? So again, during my presentation, my focus will be on, on visual data because that is you know core to, to what I've been working on. But I guess the same thing could be extrapolated to other different types of, of data. So <laughs> the big topic, you know, the big question is like, don't we have enough data? <laughs> right? I mean, there's just so many different types of websites out there that were offering, you know, visual information. And obviously, you know, again, for 15 years now, you know, new different flavors of machine learning. So again, from my humble perspective, um, and, and I've said this many times before, and it hasn't really changed, you know, just saying that you found, you found a different way to sort of like uh, put information together, such as deep learning in, in this case, doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Because if you take, and, uh, and these are again, older slides, but the same sort of like type of uh, results are still, still hold true, right? Uh, visual recognition is still not where it should be. And, and even if, if it has improved in certain domain specific uh, applications, you still have this like semantic sort of like, uh, you know, issue where obviously in this case, if you're matching a picture with another picture, well, it, you know, am I looking at an object? Am I looking at a picture? It, it's just pixels, right? So again, state of the art has improved slightly over the years, but the fundamental problems are still the same. Yeah, dealing with the false positives and the negatives of uh, that are basically kind of like coming out of these machine learning systems, um, you know, um, it's, it's difficult, right? So at the end of the day, you have an under constrained problem, as we like to call it, right? And look, you know, we have uh, done a lot of things in, in the field of machine learning, more things will come, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of smart people out there trying to kind of like find yet another generation of, of what we call pattern matching, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, I don't, I still think that like the biggest problem is, is data, as you'll see, and the type of data that you throw these uh, things. So as a roboticist, you're saying, yeah, you know, we, we've seen this before. Again, there's a lot of uh, progress right now, uh, especially over the last maybe like three to four years in the field of visual recognition. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we don't think that we want to have robots just simply leverage these and, uh, you know, operate around humans with, with uh, the robustness that like, is, is, is necessary. So again, these are exaggerations, obviously, but I do think that is a big fundamental problem when you deal with uh, 2D information and pixels. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, um, you know, it all comes back to like, well, what are we trying to solve for, right? So again, <laughs> if you're looking at this and you're a roboticist, you might have seen already, you know, <laughs> funny different types of videos that like uh, former colleagues of mine were creating at Willow Garage. Um, and they're just meant to illustrate the type of problems that like we would love to solve in, in a real world scenario and, and how difficult things are, right? And using green screens and so on, obviously that's, that's not a way to go. But even in that case, you have complex manipulation problems that essentially are being hindered by progress in, in, in 3D computer vision. So again, you have a goal. The reality is that you are going to deal with a lot of problems if all you're looking at are pixels. So um, as, a, as a scientist, I guess, you know, you have to think about like, you know, uh, why do we even use uh, imagery, right? Like how, how do we get to this stage of, of, of uh, you know, 
technical progress and in, in, in the research world where everything is biologically inspired has to be the way the way to go right a lot of folks are pushing for this and i just personally didn't think it was the right thing so um again if i go to what could be a solution to this like robot chicken and egg problem you know uh the issue for us that we identified was like okay well data great big data all those things but relevant data is probably even more important so how do we tackle the problem of like creating new types of data, um, especially as you come out of like open source and open research and so on. Uh, what do you do with, with open data to solve this problem? So again, you know, zooming out, uh, we're, we're looking at what's available, right? Like when you, when you identify a problem such as these, you can't just go and, and, you know, dig into it before understanding like what else is out there, right? So, well, the field of, of computer vision obviously has seen a lot of progress, but if you think about what is it applied on? It's it's basically that it's available on the internet. So what's what's the internet made of, right? So the visual data online is pretty much either um, sort of like represented as a, as, a, as an image, as a two D two D image, like a, as a photo, right? As we call it, which I guess we would argue is just a slice of time and space. It's a moment in time, as we like to call it, um, or a video. And, and a video is nothing but a, but a sequence of those pictures. It's just captured a certain like frame, frame per second, like frame rate, right? So again, one could argue, well, these are legacy formats. What are we doing? I mean, we've had these before artificial intelligence became a thing before the internet and before computers, right? And they just kind of like got digitized. So the fundamental technology hasn't really changed since we went through from through various stages to make cameras better but at the end of the day we're still dealing with like 2d information right and look you know you don't have to be a rocket scientist uh, to understand that at capture time right some of the, the the more modern devices that we're using such as like smartphones for capturing imagery have additional sensing uh, available such as a gyroscope for example and so you knowing the orientation of the camera with respect to like the object you're trying to take a picture of um, is very important you know but we're discarding that information and afterwards we're trying to kind of like go and solve it through machine learning, trying to infer it from, from the data. And I think that's just wrong, right? So, you know, the one of the things that really blew my mind was a presentation from um, a very famous venture capitalist, Mary Meeker, you know, from Silicon Valley. She used to work at the um, Kleiner Perkins um, and she put together this slide, I think it was around 2013 when she did this, um, if I'm not mistaken. And she was trying to predict the amount of visual data uh, that's available on the internet and and how in just two years from 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 then moving forward so 2014 and 2015 we're just about to double the amount of data on the internet right and that was like that that just blew my mind because it was unprecedented um you know with the advent of all the new social uh sort of like media applications uh video sharing as well as many other things we were about to recreate the whole internet right in just two years so that's an interesting opportunity if you think about it, because one could argue that everyone has been there before you arrived, right? Already had this legacy of 10 plus years of collecting data. Google got really big, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So how could you even compete there? Like, the, you know, everything has been fundamentally done. Um, but if it's kind of like just about to, you know, get redone, right? It's almost like ground zero, you have an opportunity. So it's almost like you're getting on the, on the ground floor of another internet, right? You're, you're, you're building another one in parallel, so to speak, and, and uh, you can start analyzing things from that perspective, right? So what is missing, right? What, what did we identify as missing? Well, I mean, you know, maybe as a uh, science fiction nerd, you go and try to see, well, what's Hollywood uh, thinking? You know, how do we envision as a species, right, that like visual data should be consumed and captured, of course, as part of that process? And uh, there's a lot of instances like this where you're, you're, you're starting to see spatial information being presented uh, in, in, in Hollywood movies. I'll play this again. Um, this is one example. Obviously, I'll, I'll let you <laughs> sort of, I guess, the movie you probably already know. Um, the whole thesis is that you should be able to capture a moment in time and space in three dimensions. And obviously, this is uh, very, very difficult to do with the current technology that we have because it would require like arrays of cameras or, you know, many, many different types of cameras and having all the information in place together. But again, it's the thought process. It's, it's the idea that really matters here. 
not the actual instantiation, if that makes sense. So, so now we're operating in this space where we're saying, okay, there is a time and space continuum <laughs> And uh, let's let's map out existing formats. We got photography as a slice of time and space. We got videos as a way to kind of capture time. You're measuring it in seconds, as we already said. Uh, we got animated GIFs somewhere in between. We got panoramas. Uh, is there space for a spatial format? Pun intended, right? Can we do something here? And that's that's how we, you know, uh, myself and a few colleagues of mine came up with this concept of there's got to be something that allows us to focus on spatial capture. Some people will call this 3D. However, I would argue that like the word 3D is, is overused and, you know, coining it 3D. There's a lot of like problems there. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but again, the, the, the basic thing is we want to have a spatial format. We want time to be abstracted out. OK, so I'll, I'll explain this more. Um, coming from research, of course, I'm thinking about 3D. Uh, and I've already shared this with you as a point cloud, right? Uh, and of course, you have meshes with textures and all sorts of other types of like volumetric and and or three D metric, uh, you know, types of information. Um, that is just one way of 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 looking at three D. If you think about what the rest of the world is is thinking, right? It's not about a point cloud. I mean, people that are not working in the field wouldn't even know again what a point cloud is. They're gonna think it's cloud computing. Um, it's about the fact that like you can kind of like pivot around things and so you can you know whether you freeze time absolutely or or, or not just pivoting around them uh seems to be extremely important and you controlling that pivot you controlling the camera movement so um looking at the fact that you know mobile again through 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 the 2010 11 12 13 started to become a really really kind of like big topic and and in 2013 or 2014, it was surpassing essentially kind of like, you know, uh, uh, I guess the desktop from, a, from an internet sort of like usage perspective. That was like the aha moment for us. And we said, look, th there's definitely room here to take a lot of these technologies that we built in personal robotics and try to actually go and create uh, a data company where we're going to like take the know-how from, from 3D computer vision, 3D perception, and all that machine learning associated with that. So just making robots grasp objects or, or map rooms and annotate semantic information to that. Can we now bring all the technology to consumer devices and create a huge repository of data? Okay. So our pedigree is that we've done all this successfully in a very niche research field. And I say niche because, well, compared to other research fields, like, you know, take chemistry, for example, or, you know, it's, a, it's still very small. Um, and uh, now the, the, the whole thought process was, you know, can we adapt some of these things to a much, much, much sort of like wider set of problems? So while actually working to solve these uh, issues, as, as you're well aware, um, we did end up building, uh, you know, uh, the Point Cloud Library. Um, and that was a fascinating project for me. And it still is, you know, it's, it's maintained by, by a consortium of folks out there. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I was a contributor uh, on many different other types of projects, whether it was, you know, uh, Gary Bratsky being my office mate at Willow Garage, we're working on OpenCV. You know, we had obviously the whole player stage gazebo that, that Brian and Richard uh, and Nate created like back in the day uh, as a phenomenal project that was almost like the precursor to some of the things that like went into Ross. Um, and um, just, just trying to create a community from scratch um, and create a need, uh, or I guess the need was there for for libraries and algorithms to sort of like deal with 3D data, but just just kind of like taking a stab at, at like doing that in a very short amount of time. And this is where you know we all have to give you know props to 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 Wheeler Garage for actually you know allowing all that to happen in a short amount of time. I would I always think that these things that are very important have a tendency of just like you know being produced by them, so like, you know, they're going to get done in some shape and form over the years, but but doing it in a very compact form, uh, again, phenomenal. Um, so, so what happened is we're building this project. It starts picking up a life of its own. We're starting to work, you know, I think so with Google Summer of Code, then commercial companies, and we're starting to see a path to actually take it and spin it off in the industry. 
and, and you see more about this in a second. So, you know, we're working at Willow on, on open science, open source research and software, and we're spinning off a company called Open Perception. Um, so before we get to that, what was the thesis here, right? Um, <laughs> the idea was that if you do open source and again, publishing papers, part of the, I guess what I would call open science and so on, um, you disseminate information much, much, much faster. And it allows you to actually get an insane amount of things done, things that are not necessarily, things that are just like most often building blocks, right? So algorithmic work, they're, they're parts of a system that will solve a problem, right? And so there's nothing to fear that, you know, you with a team of researchers will go and, and, and take big sort of like companies down or anything like that. It's just about creating an infrastructure, right? Um, and we wanted to have this opportunity to work, look at three data across multiple different types of industries, right? Robotics being one of them, but we saw um, a need to engage with other folks that were working with, you know, point cloud data in other areas because they were working on the same algorithms. They might have called those things differently, right? Different terminology in different fields, but ultimately, you know, it was very useful to, to, uh, to have that pool of folks to work together, right? Um, and, and the skills are quite different, right? If you think about, again, folks in photogrammetry and sensing versus folks working in robotics, they will look at, you know, point cloud data and, and 3D computer vision uh, in different ways, right? Um, so the whole purpose um, was to take, again, you know, this very lengthy uh, part of building any solution, right, for a problem where you do a lot of work on basic infrastructure and you always have to kind of like restart from scratch because this infrastructure is, if it's not hardened and you have to build it for any new project, you know, over and over, uh, you just spend a lot of resources on that, right? And, and, and really kind of like try to get it done by saying, look, a lot of these building blocks, you know, we could just like do in a community type of a fashion with folks all over the globe that are interested, they're gonna be really hardened. And then I'm gonna focus my time on other parts of, of the product development, right? And that's really what, you know, the whole idea behind open perception was. And, and again, it's, it's not unique. Every other spin-off, whether it was from Willow or any other foundation that take, carries to open source, they probably have the same, same ideology, right? And um, we really wanted to, to be able to foster a lot of communication, right, around, around 3D computer vision, right? So we went a lot of conferences and gave talks and workshops and even sponsored things and so on. Um, and after, I guess, a few years at, at that, through, through Willow and Open Perception, we ended up with like this massive code base. Um, and and uh, again, just lots of folks contributing and, and then reusing, right? You have, you, you know, if you are starting in, in, in the field uh, and you wanted to solve a problem, all of a sudden you didn't have to start from scratch. You had a lot of tools, tutorials, et cetera, et cetera, examples at your disposal. And that was, that's, that's major. If I would have had these when I started my PhD, I would have probably done a better job. <laughs> I'd like to believe. Um, so, so that's really what, what, what was going on there. And again, pr the project really grew uh, from, from, I guess, just myself, one user, one contributor, uh, to just tons and tons of people, right? So we were really, really happy about that. And I guess the, the most important thing is when we started hitting commercial companies to come in, right? Because it's one thing to have universities using it um, and students, uh, but another thing to sort of like get get the, the confidence of of a of an you know industrial partner that starts poking around for proof of concepts and things like that, and then starts contributing back, whether it's a financial contribution or you know ultimately uh, code. So, as we're sitting at Willow we're realizing that there's this opportunities to take some of the projects that we've been working on that are focused again on the PR2 and, and on the use cases that we have there and spin them off as separate companies. And so you have this kind of like interesting, you know, from Willow, we started spinning off companies and, and, and uh, you know, some of them went into the industry uh, as consultant, consultancy sort of like companies and others uh, essentially became these like standalone uh, uh, non-profit foundations um, and uh, you know 
for for PCL, it was um, very important to kind of continue uh, this this I guess almost tradition of of doing code sprints. So code sprints were um, built around this concept of like we're going to have a three to six months project, and we're going to go out there and just like Google Summer of Code, we're going to try to kind of like create a um, a pitch for solving a specific problem, and then pair up people from the community with companies uh, that want to solve uh, that problem, and then give back again the code uh, to PCL, right? So I think, I don't know exactly what the percentage was, but like the largest portion of the code that was written was going to go back into open source, right? So so that continued for a while, and again, we, we were able to go to conferences, and, and as I said before, um, do a good job there. Uh, even sponsored at some point, I think it was a CVPR. Uh, we, we, we actually sponsored a conference because we were able to generate, generate uh, you know, revenue from these industrial partners. And um, ultimately what I also realized while working on, 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 on PCL in uh, Open Perception is that you know, most of the code um, and the high quality code will be written over time by people that deeply care about a specific topic that's related to the project. So you can accelerate things but if you really want to have a long-term support and maintenance, some of the best things will just come naturally over time. So that's how, I guess, we ended up at some point saying that um, PCL will, if, if it's important for several industries or for robotics you know, itself, it will just be there. And it doesn't necessarily always need us. It might need us to, to, to you know, be stewards and, and, and make sure like, uh, it's going in the right direction. But we don't necessarily we can we can kind of like zoom out and and go from developers to managers if you want and let other folks kind of you know go in. especially as the project project is like on github and it has these like large communities the thing that however as i mentioned before i was still very interested in is like you have you know the open science aspect because you've been doing a lot of paper publishing and and pu pushing the code uh, uh out there uh, that, that shows how the results were generated you've done a lot of open source but what about the data? What, what about the data piece? So it goes, it just so happens that again, we were at this very interesting crossroad in, in 2013, 2014, and you know, a group of folks figured out it's an opportunity to create a standalone company now, uh, independent of everything that we've done before, and, and try to focus on the data aspect, right? So, you know, we went and um, got a lot of uh, interesting people uh, into the company from you know uh, venture capital etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and you know to start essentially um, fusion and the whole idea of fusion was that we're gonna do we're gonna build a first spatial capture that's tailored to everyday consumers so we're gonna do it on commodity devices and we're gonna look again at the problems that we've already identified which is you know, you got photography and video dominating the internet as a visual data stream. Um, they're incomplete in, in, in a sense because they only represent like a partial view of a specific scene or an object. So you really would like to pivot around and move in 3D. So they don't do that. Also, we think, um, and we kind of prove that in robotics, right? They have unsatisfactory information extraction capabilities, which means machine learning on 2D is going to work as well as it can, right? Uh, but it's always going to be a ceiling. And so really the solution should be to move to 3D, but as we'll see, not any type of 3D. It's not the point cloud, actually. The point cloud will be under the hood, but that's not going to be the final representation because we're doing something, you know, scalable for everyday people, right, for consumers. Uh, and also we got to work on, on different types, of, I guess, machine different types of machine learning, but also different types of um, applications of, 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 like, different types of data, basically, under the hood. So... We looked at this like time space continuum where we would identify okay there's there's a way for us to kind of like build a, a a new file format a new container right so we have 3d under a hood right now with fuse um but again it's, it's just beyond the point cloud it's beyond you know it starts becoming very interesting because you're getting into rendering and so if you really want to capture a scene and you got a camera that's running a certain like frequency right frame rate you won't be able to capture a continuous stream of data, right? You'll be capture, capturing a discrete stream of data, and but you want to put it together afterwards and just like you do 
you know, 3D meshing with the texturing on top, you're gonna create a, uh, basically a, an infinite space, a continuous space. So you're gonna be starting to look at light fields. So again, it's, it's beyond the fact that 3D already existed and, and people were doing already texture, um, texture meshes, right? Um, which obviously were incomplete as well, right? You had all these different artifacts, you know, if the mesh is not built correctly, you're gonna have a problem. If the blending of the textures is not done correctly, you're gonna have another problem. And people tend, tend to reject these things. The reason why this never really made, made it as a, as, as a representation is because consumers are very finicky. And you know, if pictures are great, our brain understands them really well, there's no artifacts as far as we can tell, right? Or they're minimal, right? These other things that we've built from, from again, computer graphics and so on, were mostly built for artificial objects. So if you think about the, the genesis of the, of, the, of the triangle mesh, it was actually built for computer games, one of the applications were computer games, and we were presenting like artificial characters there. These were not necessarily made or thought through to digitize real world scenes and get photorealistic appearance out of those scenes, right? But, you know, in parallel, a lot of folks in computer graphics were working on this concept of light fields. And, you know, they were, they were built by taking, you know, multiple sets of images from different angles by a camera array. And so that wasn't scalable and companies tried to afterwards build in hardware and try to build products. Lytra was a company in that space. Where we saw opportunities to kind of like try to create light fields through software. So if you have a moving camera and you can solve for this very complex problem, right, which is, I guess, the, the, the visual odometry, but it's much more complex than that. Um, you can now build a virtual camera array and you can create a light field out of that. And, not, and now you have 3D information represented differently in what we call this fuse container. And you can capture it with any, any sensor, any camera, right? Uh, you you got to control that, that camera capture, however, it's very important, right? Uh, just taking random images from the internet and just trying to put them together will only yield that much. So you're, you're going on this new paradigm. I'm going to capture any type of data, I'm going to process it differently, and I'm going to visualize it differently. And, and that's how Fusion got created, right? We saw this opportunity, we started working on, on proof of concepts, and uh, we got up and running. So what is it exactly? Like, what is our framework doing? You know, what is it useful for? And I'll go through some examples. Um, I'm going to use automotive as one of our main verticals here, right? So basically what you got is, you know, you got this capture process, which as I said before, we prefer commodity devices, low end, you know, smartphones are, are best for these. Everybody has one in their pockets. And really as you just, you just walk around objects, you, you, you pivot around an object, you capture the data from multiple angles, use all the other sensing uh, devices that you might have there, you know, gyroscopes, et cetera, et cetera. And then you pass it through this, again, cocktail, right? That's a, a you know, machine learning and computer vision and photogrammetry and all into one. And it's all leveraging data uh, that you might have captured before. So, you know, in our case, we have a very rich cloud, you know, we uh, boost over like 200 million active users and whatnot. And, and that's important because then you're going to fine tune a lot of these algorithms and, and do a really good job, especially as you try to focus on specific verticals or specific, specific types of, of, of objects. And then what's, what's the output? Well, I'll, I'll give again some examples. You know, it is in that case, you rep have a representation right now of the vehicle that you captured, but it goes beyond that. It, you don't have pixels or just pixels here. You also have 3D information. So I can kind of like take that object out of the scene, as you'll see, and do things with it. I can analyze it. I can decompose it into parts, right? I can use machine learning in different shapes and forms. Or, you know, this is something much more specific. I can analyze the type of damage that I have on a vehicle, right? Very important for the industry. And we do that with really, really high accuracy. So, you know, it all starts with a, with a 3D capture. Then you, you do what we call 3D understanding. And then you have this like again plethora of algorithms operating in that space. So you get a new file container. That's what you really have. The, the uh, take home message is you don't store things into JPEGs and MP4s or you know PCB files or OBJ files, right? It's brand new file container that stores spatial data. Um, you have the most compact representation of the visual space now. It's photorealistic. 
it's patch based and it has the light fields in as well as additional information like camera poses and whatnot and you also do a lot of pre-processing on edge on the edge right on the on the on the, um, the smartphone and then afterwards you can do all these other other things with it right and really you think about a format for the future which should be available for every type of like uh you know visualization uh, device possible right so you do the desktop you do the web uh with with you know um, um i guess webgl and we have some stuff in WebAssembly and so on um mobile and then ar vr so we've seen again a really large opportunity to work with tons of different commercial partners um you know in automotive so we work on a few different verticals right in automotive for example you know we have um all sorts of uh problems to solve uh, one of them that's particularly interesting is you got these used cars right it's like everyday complex objects they're, they're physical assets they're they're expensive you want to be able to image them really quickly right so if i'm a seller i should be able to go around the vehicle and just capture really quickly and then build a representation analyze it automatically using machine learning and then be able to you know pass it through a buyer that can now enjoy that and look at it from all angles and really understand the value of, of, of that asset, right? So we work with a lot of the different partners all across the, the globe um, to sort of like help with, with you know, sales and, and then this condition analysis. That's, a, that's actually the main focus for us as a company. Um, but, you know, we also dabbled in a few other types of experiences. So what was interesting for us is we started Fusion and we got all these algorithms and we got no data. So we actually built a consumer application, a free version, and we call this our 5%. It was using like a very sort of rudimentary set of algorithms from our platform, about 5% of them. And um, it was doing a good job. It was easy. It was allowing people to kind of capture it and share it. And so we pushed it out on, on all sorts of different types of flavors of smartphones and whatnot and got a really large community around that. Um, and that was really good for us because we, we, we could like test algorithms extremely fast. And we got 100 million people using this stuff. That's 100 million kind of like beta testers. You get, you know, crash reports and bugs. And you, know, you see when things go wrong, you go back and refine your algorithms and then you get data, which in an anonymous fashion, you can kind of like grind through your machine learning. Um, same thing, of course, you know, you got e-commerce for cards, well, you can also get e-commerce for everyday objects, right? So basically you can represent objects and scenes. And, and, and we focused on objects because we thought this was like an underserved sort of like uh, section, right? I mean, people were doing already kind of like panoramas or panoramic type of representations for rooms and whatnot, but not a lot of things were being done for for objects or people or, or, or you know, things like that. Um, so just going really quickly through, well, I guess what, what we call the value prop. And, you know, as I said before, we, we push this technology onto smartphones as a camera mode. So lots of devices around the world, you know, had and might still have uh, you know, this function, and they're creating basically these representations directly natively in the camera, right? And then you do lots of things with it. Again, you can extract those elements uh, from the scene, you can do visual effects. Uh, we've done a really good job to try to understand essentially, you know, parts of the scene in real time. So in this case, you see someone moving around, you understand the human body, uh, so you can animate virtual characters. And it's all built on the same engine, right? It sounds like a lot of different types of applications, but it's all built on the same engine. It was very, very easy to kind of like get up and running and do, you know, things like 3D segmentation, extract objects from a scene, place them on different scenes, as you might see there. Um, so this was just a way for us to kind of like get started and understand really quickly you know, if consumers like this type of formats, you know, what can we do with them? You know, what are they useful for? Um, and just kind of like go and slowly build that robust enterprise platform. And so, as I said before, automotive and e-commerce uh, of everyday objects are things that like we, we tend to focus on at Fusion. Um, and I'll show again some some examples of what we're doing in the in, 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 in automotive, right? As I said before, condition analysis and just building this very beautiful representations of cars that you can place on pretty much any website and you do interior and exterior and obviously because you have a space to navigate in now you can extract heat maps for analytics which are again very very useful instead of people just like consuming visual data as a picture or a video and you don't really know if they're even looking at it um, by people actively by folks actively navigating in that space now you get this really rich sort of set of like analytics as heat maps um, and then again, lots and lots and lots of other types of 
applications, which I'm not going to focus on right now. Um, and again, very, very robust from a machine learning perspective because you're operating on more than just pixels. Same principle on, on uh, e-commerce and fashion, uh, just being able to, to create these uh, representations and then visualize them again on, on things like the HoloLens or the, the Magic Leap One, um, and, and then building uh, tools for, for, for the web as well as for mobile, um, for you know, tagging and integrating on different types of websites and whatnot. So um, there's a lot of things that we could still say about, about the work that we're doing at Fusion, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Obviously, I know we're going to have a Q&A at some point, so I look forward to, to talk to you guys um, about, about other aspects of our work. Um, but I want to just kind of like end on, on, this, on this topic of, um, you know, the way I look at my career and, and what we try to accomplish throughout the years. Um, and I think it's not just me personally, it's just like the entire team that I've been working on with um, whether it was like Wheel of Garage and then PCL and Open Perception, um, we, we saw this opportunity to say, if we're focusing on algorithms right now, and at some point we can focus on data, you know, is there a way in which we kind of like open that data, just like we open up the algorithms um, and essentially go back into, into the mode of, okay, what's the next iteration of the algorithms that we have to create? So PCL and OpenCV and anything else that has to do with like computer vision basically exist because data was existent in some shape and form on the internet. And then we we build these things on top and we, we open them to the world and create these like wonderful communities to work on them. But at some point we realized that like the type of data that we were working with was inappropriate or some of the problems that we're trying to solve was just inadequate. So we went now and we're creating you know, new types of data formats and at scale, you know, with basically big enterprise companies. Um, what would it take for us to, to, to take this data and, and open it and then see if we can create the next generation of algorithms now that work on top of it? These are the thoughts that basically we've been having for a while, um, both when we were at Open Perception, but now obviously at Fusion. So um, I, I'll, I'll pause here. Uh, lots of things still, you know, need to be said. But um, from my perspective, if open source or, or I guess this this topic of open science, and, and as far as I understand, it's all about like sharing and disseminating information and being able to replicate results really quickly, uh, wouldn't have been available. I don't think that like I personally would have made any progress in my career or with any of the things that. Uh, uh, I've been doing as, as well as like any of my, any of my peers. So I think it's extremely important to to take that lens and say that, you know, without open science, without open source software, we're actually grinding and not making the progress that we should be having as a society. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Looking forward to your Q&A.